Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first ever series of webcasts produced by our grade 12 students. Please allow me to address the students first. My, great, my dear grade 12 students, congratulations in advance. In class, we always talk about how the application of knowledge is the real power. And I'm looking forward to watching all of these webcasts because it will really show how you have taken advantage and are using all of your strengths and greatness um, to create a better impact in your community um, and hopefully in the world. To our speakers, uh, the coordinators, and especially Sir Redem for taking time to guide the students and sharing your knowledge and expertise in these relevant topics. Uh, we thank you for your time and we look forward to learning from you. And finally, to everyone who are, will be watching our webcast. Like my students, I invite you to apply the knowledge that you will learn because it is only through the application of knowledge that we can really um, benefit, reap the benefits of these. And at the same time, please feel free to share the knowledge or the webcast so that more people will be informed, will be helped, and protected. Congratulations again to everyone who is part of this webcast. Hello, everybody. First and foremost, uh, let me uh, extend my praise to the grade 12 students under the helm of Mr. Redem Taco, their instructor in the subject, Empowering Technology. Now, this webcast presentation, a combined word of web and broadcast, is indeed a milestone for the BIS online learning program. It is wonderful uh, to note also that this webcast would tackle relevant issues and concerns that everyone should know. I'm also looking forward to seeing how this event would be able to juxtapose two related topics, cybersecurity and threats online. Um, being in the era of uh, technology, every user or owner needs to be protected from cybercrime, uh, hackers, spyware, computer viruses, and the uh, parameter of the uh, data protection policy. Now, adding thrill to this webcast is a former BIS teacher would be sharing a topic that is timely and relevant. This will surely help everyone on how to cope up on the online school and mental health amidst the pandemic. Exciting, isn't it? So once again, to the grade 12 students with Mr. Taco, congratulations. And to the esteemed speakers, thank you for saying yes to um, share your expertise to everyone present in this website, webcast presentation. Thank you so much and thank you, God. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be, maybe here in the Philippines or in other countries. Before we start, I would like to thank all of you who have tuned into our webcast, and we would like you to know that we greatly appreciate it. Not only that, we would also like to thank our three guest speakers and teachers who have supported us through this webcast. So let's go on with it. I am Ryan Chua of Grade 12 Benedict International School, and I will be your host today. For today's topic, it will be about threats in the internet. Also, before we start with the webcast itself, feel free to ask questions on the comment section and we will answer it to our fullest capabilities. So I won't make you guys wait any longer. Let's start! From Benedictine International High School, or International School, our next speaker is Mr. JJ. Um, good afternoon, Mr. JJ. Um, could you please introduce yourself to our guest? Good afternoon. I am Jesse James Xavier of the seventh grade class in Benedict International School. And I'd really like to thank you for letting me in on this. Of course, of course. We're glad to have you. Um, we really appreciate for giving us your time. Just to start things off, how are you uh, during this pandemic? 
I'm actually doing qu- quite great. Um, even though we're actually moving into our new townhouse, um, mm. there's not really any direct problems with COVID. But um, li- li- lately, um, we've noticed that there have been like a spike in cases, and we've just been trying to be safe and staying indoors. Of course, we want our guests, be- our guests, to be very safe. So we're gonna start with the qu- our questions for Mr. JJ. Um, our first question is. Do you know how to decipher whether or not something is real or fake news? How uh, can it affect someone's life? Uh, so in my opinion, telling real news from fake news is pretty tricky, especially with those who are unfamiliar with the media, right? So, But of course, there are definitely many ways to figure it out. So let's say, if you're reading a headline, you really need to be skeptical because we, to, to be fair, not everyone can figure it out, right? So you have to think logically here. What does it claim? Um, when was it published? Where was it published? So if you use your common sense, you're less likely to fake for false news. Yeah. But despite this, we have to be very careful when reading articles because it's really easy to trick people with false information. And this can really affect someone's life in many ways because nowadays, fake news can seem so believable that it's actually so hard um, to determine the truth. Like, let's use this pandemic as an example. As coronavirus spreads around the world, so is fake news. A lot of YouTube videos or posts on Facebook, they share a lot of complex conspiracy theories that can make a lot of sense to those who are oblivious. Like, the coronavirus is an engineered bioweapon that, that was accidentally or purposely leaked. Yeah, or, or Or the vaccines, they're gonna make you die. Like, they were made by doctors, but, you know, they're gonna make you die. When we believe these types of fake news, um, it causes real-world problems by discouraging people from getting vaccinated, wearing masks, and staying indoors. Yeah, uh, for me, I have parents that are very, are very old. They tend to believe everything, so it's good that um, us younger generations already know how to sort of decipher it. And it's our duty also as uh, students or as younger generations to teach people to more or less know the difference. So, yes, in the uh, in the end, when we have our own computers, it's or or any device actually, it's really our responsibility to know what's real and what's fake uh, in the end. Yeah. Okay, for our next question, do you think that cyberbullying is a big problem today, especially because of the technological advancements in the past years? Yes, of course. Um, cyberbullying or bullying, they're all big problems, and especially cyberbullying, because nowadays, because of the technological advancements throughout the years. Kids and especially those who have access to the internet, they, they can become victims of cyberbullying. And it's not easy to escape because you're not on the campus or on the playground, right? And many people, especially teens, they connect through social media. So it's really hard to ignore online harassment compared to um, the traditional bullying in schools. And in the end, it's very dangerous with genuine, severe, and sometimes deadly consequences because it can lead to suicide. Yes, because of um, Messenger and everything, you have so many ways to chat a person like in Viber or in Facebook or Instagram. There are a lot of ways to do it, not only just one way like before. More than that, there are also predators. It's very dangerous nowadays. Our next question is, could you possibly cite examples or possible apps that may be breaching someone's data privacy? Uh, I can't really mention a, a specific app that could be breaching someone's privacy, but uh, it's re- actually really hard to detect sometimes the antiviruses. They can't really detect the apps that you download. So these apps can disguise themselves as uh, helpful programs, but things are actually happening behind the scenes. Uh, for example, um, keyloggers or rats, they can be um, one of the many harmful programs that can be used maliciously. It's very hard to find out if something is trustworthy or not um, because um, n- nowadays, our, our only ways to talk to people are via Facebook or Messenger. Yes, I completely agree with you. Uh, due to this problem in data privacy, how do you think it can affect a person in, for you? If an app or anything in general reaches your compu- computer security, um, it can be definitely used for bad intentions because this can cause um, damage to your computers or the network fun- function. But not only that, actually. it compromises sensitive data and this can be used for fraudulent purposes um, like people risk having their identity their personal files and personal information stolen from them um next what can people do to lessen the chance of their data privacy being breached um people have become so intricate in 
uh, in writing these programs that can affect your computer in very many bad ways. So, uh, in some ways, uh, there are there are simple ways actually to avoid your data being breached. So, I personally would say scan your computer using your antivirus. You can even use Windows Defender. That's already built in. Or if you're using Mac, you can use Avast. I think you can use it there as well. And use anti-malware programs like Malwarebytes frequently. So. Um, if you think a program looks suspicious or you downloaded um, a suspicious program, you will have to delete it immediately because you're just going to add more damage to your computer, right? So, But if you're worried about being infected, you can check your MS config. You can check if anything was added to the start of programs. But I suggest doing research about them first. And I killed the, I killed the programs that have fishy names or um, fishy CPU disk and network usage and kill them if they don't seem normal anymore. Mm, yes. Thank you for that. Um, next, I'm pretty sure you know what scams are. They're very popular nowadays, mm-hmm. especially through technology. Um, for you, how has scams and scammers have evolved as time goes on? And do you think that in the near future, scams will inevitably be useless in terms of no one will fall for it? Uh, like I. L- like what we discussed earlier, technology is advancing, but that also means scams and scammers have evolved in a way that they are harder to figure out. But as people become more careful of these scams, and I'll be answering the near future question now, um, I don't really think that in the near future, scams will inevitably be useless uh, because um, as more people become more wary and careful of these scams, uh, the more intricate and convincing they will be. It's very hard to predict. Yes, how do you think this scamming industry became so big and how do you think we can better educate people to not fall for it? Uh, the scamming industry has become so big because, simply put, greed. It's come to the point where it can be even considered a, a profession. But we can educate people not to fall for it by promoting ways to avoid scams. Like, um, if, you're, if you think you're a victim of what you think is a possible scam, you have to stop and talk to someone you can trust. Yes, I completely agree once again. <laughs> So that's basically it for today. Once again, uh, I would like to thank you for giving us your time. No, no problem. I, I'm, I'm great to be here. On to our next speaker. Uh, good morning, Miss Daisy. For today, we have Miss Daisy as our guest teacher speaker. So I will let her introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. I am teacher Daisy M. Solomon. I graduated from St. Paul College, Quezon City. And I am currently working at Benedictine International School as a Filipino teacher and um, systems thinking coordinator. Thank you, Ms. Daisy, on that. Right now, we're going to start with our questions, our questions for you. Um, do you know how to decipher whether or not something is real or fake news? I can easily decipher whether it is a fake or real news because of my own perspective. For me to be able to decipher a fake and real news, I do self-check and get the facts. I check the comments. I read the code in the story or in the news I'm reading. I pay also attention to the legitimate uh, sources and even looked at who said it. I really agree with that. Po. There, I, me myself, when I was scrolling through Facebook, I've already seen a lot of fake news and stuff like that. Po. How can it affect someone's life? Po? For the fake news, uh, of course, it really affects their life because, like what they said, it creates confusion. So there will be misunderstanding uh, about important information. So I think that is the effect for the people or someone's life. Um, do you think? that cyberbullying is a big problem nowadays because of technology. And of course, despite of the good effect of the internet has brought us to the students, to the parents, of, and of course for us teachers, there are some people who use it with malicious intent. In just as virtual bullying or cyberbullying has existed with the use of dig- digital uh, devices such as cell phone, computers, and tablets, it creates a big problem in the whole world. Uh, yes, Paul. <laughs> Um, so for our next question po is what can you suggest to people who are experiencing cyberbullying to possibly lessen its effect? So especially you're a teacher, you have students like you said po and you have um, children. What do you think you can tell them or suggest to them so that it can be lessened? So to lessen this effect as a parent and educator, uh, the following are very important. Number one, um, 
I have to monitor social activity of my children. It's a balance on monitoring uh, the online activities but respecting also their privacy. And then create or do some physical activities uh, that they can enjoy such as biking, walking, jogging, even picnic, okay, uh, to eat together, to lessen the hours of their online activities. And also do some meditation activities that can be searched through online and also have a meaningful communication with my children, with my students to respond with love and support, always be willing to listen to what they have to say and also reassure them that I am there to help them to resolve the issue. Yes, it's very important that you should have someone there that will support you and that will always be there. So next is, could you possibly cite examples or possible apps that may be breaching someone's data privacy? Um, some common and possible apps that may be breaching someone's data pri privacy are through Facebook, uh, Messenger, uh, dating apps, there's also WhatsApp, mobile banking, uh, payment app, even grab app, delivery app, online shopping app, mail app. So there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, possible apps that would uh, maybe breaching someone's data privacy because these are the apps that we are used to, uh, especially nowadays. So um, breaching someone's data pri privacy happens when we use these different apps. So we have to really be careful. Yeah, like you said but earlier, the examples for every app we, we use is a possible way for them to breach our personal data. Uh, so for our next question po is, what can people do to lessen the chance of their private data being breached or being shared to other people? Uh, for me to lessen the chance of my private da data being breached, I secure the password. Um, I update the software. I use antivirus protection. I never give, that's very important, I never give and share important details of my bank account, such as PIN number, passwords, and others. Uh, yes, Pop. There are people who, uh, who send their numbers and who share where they live, and sometimes it can really be bad if people can access those data. So, for our next question, please, how has scams and scammers have evolved as time goes on? And do you think that in the near future, scams will be inevitably be useless in terms of no one will fall for it? Um, like what I said a while ago, the internet or the online technology is very useful way to reach uh, people uh, without spending a lot of money or a lot of time. Uh, here in the Philippines, I think uh, they continue to face the challenge or effectively addressing the problem of internet fraud, uh, illegal cyber activity, scams, scammers is currently on the rise or even in the other parts of the world. So I think in the near future, this problem and challenge will stop if people will be more aware and mindful of sharing the important information of his or herself. And if we will not give the scammers an opportunity to destroy or take advantages of our physical factors like what we are experiencing like, like now, uh, people feel stressed, uh, there are also social issues, uncertainty, okay? especially now that we are experiencing pandemic. And also, uh, by surfacing and testing our assumptions on what we see and read on Facebook or other social media, we can easily understand things better. Always check the information we collected online. Does information or does perspective changes our behavior for the better? Even being extra careful when we are doing online transactions or even we do shopping or ordering food using different apps. We still enjoy the benefits and the significance of the use of this technology and it will not be harmful for us. Scamming will stop and be useless if we just be careful and mindful of our uh, activities through online. Yeah, um, scams are really getting worse nowadays. Even through text, they already know our numbers, they already know how to reach us and it's getting scary every day also. So that was our last question. Um, Thank you very much, Miss Daisy. I hope you enjoyed and I hope 
um, that our viewers learned a lot from you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So guys, this is our next guest speaker for today, uh, Mr. Lloyd Dan. He's a very good friend of mine. So I'll let him introduce himself. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Lloyd Tan. I'm from... I graduated from the Ateneo de Manila University um, for a Bachelor of Science in Management Information Systems with a specialization in Data Science and Analytics. Um, I'm currently working as the VP for Technology in Adobe for Accessories. Yes. Uh, thank you. And that, well, let's start. Um, for our topic, like I said earlier, it's going to be threats in the internet. I would like you to define uh, what is fake news. Okay, so um, fake news, based on my understanding, can mean a story that is fabricated, it's entirely fake, or that some parts of it are fake. Maybe some parts are are fake, but the rest are verifiable in order to prove its credibility to the people in order for it to not be entirely fake. Um, this can mislead, mislead people. Yeah, Next is, is cyberbullying. Uh, yeah, cyberbullying. I think that there are many types of cyberbullying, but the most apparent one are releasing sensitive information about people, most especially people that haven't given their consent to releasing such sensitive information about them. Um, so next is data privacy. So data privacy, it's what is visible from you, what you show to the internet, and what is private. To you. So like like the data that uh, you should not be sharing in online. Um, next is one of the most uh, common threats in the internet that I know of scamming. There are different types of scams. But I think the most common one is phishing, pretending to be a website or a person that's chatting you, pretending to be part of, for example, Globe. Yeah. So I guess that's one of the biggest and most common scams that are found on the internet. Um, that's for our intro. Thank you very much. Let's start with our chatter. So, our, my first question for you is, uh, do you know how to decipher whether or not something is fake news or real news? Yeah. I think, really, yeah, big fake news is a really big issue, most especially now, that we are in a technology age. We are always on the internet. And most especially, our main news outlet isn't TV anymore. Well, for most of us, it's not TV anymore. But rather, what we see in social media, we are we are drawn to click on links that have links that are giving us news. So I think the first way in order for us to identify if something is real or fake news is um, our mindset. Rather than taking things as they are, you have to start to question things. Learn how to question things, most especially when you feel like something is not. Yeah, if at first glance you think, oh, this can't be right, maybe it isn't. But since a famous person said it, or maybe a famous news outlet said it, maybe you're going to say, oh, that's it. You're not reading between the lines, you don't click on the link anymore. Just because, oh, for example, this and this did really bad thing. But in reality, the article may say something else. Usually, the titles of news articles online um, are there for clickbait. They're trying to get more views by having a very intriguing headline that their article might just uh, graze upon. You know? So the second way for you to know if something is real or fake news is to know where it's coming from. So how are you receiving the news? Is it a primary or a secondary source? Is the source that you have reliable or not? Or is it even satire? There are some people that do not differentiate between these things. Because most first of all, if it is a satire, then it's there for comedy. It's not real. Or even if it were real, it's some stretched out version of the truth. Yeah, and uh, as I said a while ago, there are two different types of sources, which is the primary and secondary source. Uh, so the primary source that I'm talking about is a first-hand account, and they're considered to be the most reliable sources. For example, that I am to tell you that, oh, um, somebody went out of this building, and I, I told you, or I wrote it down, then I would be a primary source. 
So these are the originals. And if the news are coming from this, you are more than certain that it's the truth. However, there are some cases that this is not the case. So some examples of primary sources might be maybe diaries, government documents, interviews, and maybe manuscripts. The other type of source is the secondary type of source, and these are sources that provide something extra to the truth. It can be an analysis, an interpretation, or a retelling of the statement that the primary source had. And these sources can attempt to persuade the readers in order to believe a certain kind of truth, the truth that the writer believes in. For example, I were to tell you that somebody stole my Snickers bar, you proceed to tell other people about it. You, you would be a secondary source because you can have your own interpretation to it. You can bend it however way you want. You can tell people that the person was hungry, even though I didn't explicitly tell you that he was hungry. Yeah, they can add their own twist to it, their own analysis. Some examples of secondary sources, by the way, are textbooks, newspaper editorials, opinion pieces, and encyclopedias. Another thing that you should do is to take account the bias. Not only of the source, but to your own bias that you may have. So, taking into account the source's bias, um, because they may distort the truth into the favor of who are they biased towards. For example, Moka Uson, she had a bias towards Duterte and she made him look good. And he made his political rivals look worse than he is. So, you should also take into account if you have your own biases. You can fall into the trap of selective reading and you start nitpicking details from the article, even though that's not the entire truth that the article is saying. And you should also be careful to not fall into the trap of believing what a famous person says. Uh, this is a fallacy that's more commonly known as the appeal to authority. For example, LeBron James says that a certain type of vitamins is good for you because he takes it. Then a lot of people will say, oh, LeBron James takes this vitamin, so it must be true. But LeBron James is actually not an authority on vitamins. So that's another thing you should take into account. Yeah, yeah um, you should always really be aware that not just because they're famous or they're very well known, everything that they share is very trustworthy. So with all this saying about fake news, how do you think it can affect someone's life? Mm, I think it can affect them most, especially when you start spreading fake news yourself and people actually call you out for it, it can also be an outlet for cyberbullying. Um, people will start calling you out, oh, that's fake, why are you spreading that? And it can also lead to more misinformation and a lot of people spinning it the way that they want to, adding their own truths to it, but mostly cyberbullying and trolling people, you know? Right now, actually, I feel that why people believe so much fake news is because the people, their friends, their family are actually one, the ones who share it to them. And that's why they mm -hmm. feel that they have to believe it because it comes from their family or their friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I believe that also. I guess that's uh, one way that fake news spreads. Like you mentioned earlier, um, I wanted to tackle another threat in the internet. So my next question for you is, do you think that cyberbullying is a big problem today, especially because of technological advancements in the past years? Yeah, I think it's a big problem, most especially um, right now, because it's so easy to get on the internet. And because of that, there's not much internet literacy when it comes to accessing the internet. So you can even own a smartphone for even less than 5,000 pesos. And that leads to a lot of people that aren't really um, tech savvy to go on social media maybe they share share things they do things that they aren't supposed to so um this can lead to a lot of cyberbullying most especially when there is a leak of personal information be it through unauthorized access of their device or maybe from the person person himself like for example somebody that who, who isn't uh tech savvy or who is literate in the internet might accidentally share a picture that they weren't supposed to. Also right now, cyberbullying is more apparent because it's so easy to stalk people, most especially on their profiles when there's not much privacy settings. Uh, this can lead to many da dangerous situations. Some photos that may be leaked can be saved onto uh, the person's phone. And it's very troubling because 
even if you take something out of the internet, it stays there forever. So, um, there are a lot of people that tend to call out or humiliate people using these uh, photos or conversations that they might have. And this can really affect a person's mental health. And that's very troubling, most especially in this time that we are very dependent on the internet. And most especially these days, not even because of your personal information, um, even through your own opinions, you can be already cyberbullied. These days, people are very easily triggered about people's opinions. And it can lead to a lot of flack coming from social media, even people that you don't know. And it's so easy to create dummy accounts or fake accounts in order to bait out personal information because it's so easy to flame people on the internet, most especially because um, you're behind the keyboard and you really don't have much repercussions when it comes to this. Right? Um, yeah, uh, actually for me, now more than ever, it's easier because everyone is already online, even school is already online so people are just like one text away and it's easier to bully people that's just one text away really you can just contact them you can't really evade them as much they can really bully you immediately so on that uh, you actually mentioned earlier that it can actually affect someone's mental health and someone's um feelings um what can you suggest to people who are experiencing cyber bullying to possibly lessen its effect i think the first way and the most um most preferable way is to actually talk to the person that's cyberbullying you. And if you can come to uh, some sort of agreement, some amicable agreement, um, that would benefit you or maybe ben benefit both parties, then that would be the best course of action. However, there are some times that this does not happen. And I really, I really suggest that you try and take some time away from the internet if you are experiencing some some sort of cyberbullying, maybe even deactivate your account, to try to get get away from the toxicity. And since it is very easy to bully people, just try not to um, spread anything else or don't play something that you really don't want to share. And when you're trying to address what had happened, for example, somebody leaked some, some photos of you or some uh, conversation that led you to become like some sort of bad person, um, only try to address the issue when you think that people will, will start to understand or you should really take a more apologetic side to it um, rather than trying to defend your position unless you can prove that you are really in the right. And if it is severe, really, really severe and it's really affecting you in some way, um, you can go to the authorities but this should be um, the final resort because there is actually uh, there are actually laws protecting uh, data privacy and from cyberbullying. My next question is actually about scammers and do you think how has scams and scammers have evolved as time goes on? And do you think that the near future scams will inevitably be useless in terms of no one will fall for it anymore? I think scams have really grown a lot. It's very very convincing nowadays. <laughs> yeah, right now it's really convincing. Like. It's so hard to detect sometimes the scam, most especially if it's if it is um, done correctly, and very very well made, and most especially if they targeted you for a long time. Um, it's so easy. I guess there's a lot of uh, scams. For example, spear phishing, wishing, smishing, uh, whaling, and uh, email phishing. There's also, but uh, I think the most recent one that I have come across is um, angler fishing that's what they call it angler fishing and I think there are some people there there are some of us that have been mentioned on Facebook before that from somebody that we don't know somebody just suddenly mentions you and then it's a link to let's say a porn site or some um, cloned website that we're not sure of and it's a type of drive-by attack because it's a two-stage part. It's a two-stage attack. First, it it tries to um, download a Trojan horse onto your computer when you click the link. And after you do put on, um, after you do click the link and it downloads the Trojan horse, it will start to mention all a lot of other people's names so that they can 
um, find the link and hopefully they will click it and it's very troubling and a lot of people really don't know that that's possible so on that how do you think that the scamming industry became so big and how do you think that we can better educate people to not fall for it i think it's so easy to do that's why i mean you can automate so many of the processes um when it comes to like vishing smishing it's, it's, it's really more on social engineering it's more on social hacking um how you talk to people how you think somebody who's going to believe it how you research a demographic of a person i really think that um it's easier to do and it's a lot of money like what you said it's a multi-million uh, dollar industry and i really think it's very ripe now the industry right now is very ripe because um, a lot of people are still new to the internet most especially those that need to go into the internet old people that that started being taught by their grandkids for example or people that really aren't well versed into the internet but have to use the internet because they need to for work and i really think that there there are a lot of ways for us to educate the people that um are getting scammed because um first of all it's a change of mindset on not believing like for example the fake news not believing what you see it's it's too if it's too good to be true then it's it might not be true like oh i, I want an iphone from what nothing right? and i really think um more more active prevention I am rather than just um, than just reaction is better. You have to prevent the attack from happening before, uh, rather than reacting to the attack. Uh, for example, have you noticed in coffee shops there are some free Wi-Fi that aren't official? There are some Wi-Fi that are unprotected that you can connect to. So basically, what people are doing here is. When they connect to these these networks and you start to send data into the internet, they're actually going to intercept the data that you you are sending to the internet. Um, that's what they call packet sniffing, and it's not really created for scamming, but it can be it can be used to get personal information. Um, that was my last question for you. And once again, I would like to thank you for your time. I hope our viewers will learn a lot. Um, in terms of they can educate already themselves, not only themselves but also their the elders who are already on the online. So once again, thank you, Mr. Lloyd.